premiums. We should repeal this law now and replace it with common sense, patient-centered alternatives. Otherwise, our economy will stagnate, our small businesses will not be able to expand, and the medical device industry in my district will continue to suffer. And I yield back. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. I now yield a minute and a half to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Speer. Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman for yielding. You know, the real question is, well, who is supporting this repeal of health reform? Are the doctors of America supporting it? No. The American Medical Association opposes. Is AARP supporting a repeal? No. They're opposed to it. Are the hospitals supporting a repeal? No. They're opposed to it as well. Who supports a repeal of health care reform? The National Chamber of Commerce. Period. So what do our constituents really want? They want the cost to be brought down. There's not one of us that hasn't heard a complaint from a constituent saying, I can't afford it anymore. Well, health care reform requires that 80% of the premium go to providing health care. It's starting to put a governor on the cost of health insurance. The second thing that people are concerned about is access for their kids and for themselves. Well, let's talk about these children. In my district, there are 30,000 children with pre-existing conditions. And I know that you've gotten the same phone calls that I've gotten. A parent calling, cr crying on the phone, talking about the leukemia their child has or the asthma their child has, and their fear that if their spouse loses their job, they won't have health insurance and they'll go to the individual market and there will be no health insurance. Let me tell you about Sophie O'Reilly, who at five years of age had very serious asthma. Her parents went to every insurer in the individual market, could not get insurance. So what did they do? They went bare for a year in order to be able to access insurance. Can I have 15 more seconds, Mr. Chairman? Um, HR2 is bad medicine. I urge a no vote. Time the gentlelady expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. At this time, I yield one minute to a distinguished member of the Ways and Means Committee, the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Byrd. Gentleman from North Dakota is recognized for one and one half minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in firm support of repealing this job-killing health care law. This is a $500 billion tax on small business when we need these job creators to help put our country back on track. America's small business cannot grow with the tax heights and government mandates in this law. Medicare payroll taxes will increase, costly penalties will be imposed on small business, and there will be increased health care costs. Repealing this law and removing these barriers will provide business with the certainty that they need to help get America back on track. My wife is a family practice doctor. When this law first passed, our first concern was this puts government between a patient and their doctor. We need to repeal this law and put those health care decisions back between the patient directly and their doctor. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. Jim yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. I now yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Price. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for one and one half minutes. Mr. Speaker, this bell lays bare what this new Republican majority is all about. A yes vote would take away tax credits available to up to 17,000 small businesses in my district alone, credits that will let them offer their employees insurance coverage just like their larger competitors do. A yes vote on repeal would include would increase the average cost of prescription drugs for seniors in the donut hole coverage gap by more than $500 this year and more than $3,000 by 2020. A yes vote on repeal would say to parents who now for the first time can get affordable coverage for their children with pre-existing conditions, once again you can be denied coverage altogether. This legislation is flying under disgracefully false colors. Fiscally sound? The CBO says it will increase deficits by $230 billion over the next 10 years. Job killing? Repealing reform would cost as many as 4 million jobs over the next decade. Our Republican colleagues have put their Tea Party base above everything else, including the health care needs of the American people. We must recognize their cynical political gesture for what it is. This House can and must do better. I yield back. Jim yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. At this time, I yield one minute to the, to, the, to the distinguished gentleman from Ohio, the Speaker of the House. Speaker is recognized. 
Well, let me thank uh, my colleague uh, for yielding, and I'm going to thank all the members of this body for a spirited but respectful debate on what is a critical issue to the American people. Uh, both sides of the aisle have very different viewpoints on what government's role in this health care uh, issue should be. And if there's one thing that we do agree on, it's that this health care law needs improvement. The President said so in as much yesterday. And why does it need improvement? One only needs to look at the facts. Yesterday, 200 economists and experts uh, put out a letter calling this health care bill a barrier to job growth. The letter talks about how employers are struggling to keep up with all the mandates and tax hikes in this law, uh, flooding the job market with additional uncertainty. One thing the American people wanted out of health care reform was lower cost, uh, which the authors of this law promised. But according to these economists, this law will increase spending by nearly $1 trillion, and that's a minimum number, and add nearly $1.5 trillion to the national debt. So if we agree that this law needs improving, why would we keep it on the books? Why would we keep one hand tied behind our backs when we're dealing with 10 percent unemployment and a $14 trillion national debt? Now let me be clear about what repealing this health care law means for families, small businesses, and taxpayers. Repeal means preventing more than $770 billion in tax hikes in eliminating all the mandates and penalties so that small businesses can grow and hire new workers. Repeal means reducing spending by $540 billion, another step in tackling the massive debt that faces our kids and grandkids. Repeal means protecting more than 7 million seniors from losing or being denied coverage under Medicare Advantage, a program they like. And repeal means paving the way for better solutions that will lower the cost of without destroying jobs or bankrupting our government. And repeal means keeping a promise. This is what we said we would do. Uh, we listened to the people. We made a commitment to them, a pledge to make their priorities our priorities. And when you look at the facts and when you listen to the people, this is a promise worth keeping. Uh, let's stop payment on this check before it can destroy more jobs and put us into a deeper hole. Then let's work together to put in place reforms that lower the cost without destroying jobs or bankrupting our government. Let's challenge ourselves to do better. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. I now yield one minute to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Reyes. One the gentleman minute. from Texas is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. I rise to express my strong opposition to H.R. 2, which seeks to dismantle the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Repealing this law would be detrimental to districts like the one that I represent that have unsustainably high rates of people without health insurance. Nationally, about one in five people are without health insurance. The problem in my district means one in three is without basic health coverage. That's 230,000 people in my district alone. When these individuals can't get preventative care and they get sick, they wind up in the emergency room, which is the most expensive kind of health care there, there is. According to the latest figures from our county hospital, more than $500 million of local uh, property tax have been used to cover the cost of those who could not pay for treatment and services. $500 million. We passed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act to help address this problem and provide affordable health care insurance to those that currently are uninsured. I urge my colleagues to vote against H.R. 2. Thank you. Town gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. If I might inquire how much time is remaining. The gentleman from Michigan has seven minutes remaining. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, has seven minutes remaining. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, has five and one-half minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Mr. Crenshaw. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for one minute. 
I thank the gentleman for yielding, thank him for his great leadership. And Mr. Speaker, I plan to vote to repeal this health care law, replace it with some common sense workable solutions. Why? Because I've been listening to my constituents, listening to what they have to say, what they ask for. And I can tell you, they are not asking for a bill that weakens our economy uh, and causes jobs to disappear. They're not asking for a brand new entitlement uh, and then pretending only partly to pay for it. They're not asking for a, a bill that takes away the right of seniors to have a choice in the Medicare program. And they're certainly not asking for new taxes. But that's what they're getting under this health care bill, unless it's replaced. What they're asking for is the right to choose their own doctor, the right to get the treatment they need when they need it. That's what they're asking for, but they're asking that we bring down the cost, make some common sense reforms, make it more affordable, more accessible. That's what we should focus on. I yield back. The gentleman's expired. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. And Mr. Speaker, it's now my privilege to yield to Mr. Davis, a former very distinguished member of our committee, a minute and a half. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Under no circumstances would I vote to repeal the most effective, most meaningful, most sensitive health legislation that has been passed in this country since the Medicare Medicaid provisions of the 1960s. Under no circumstances would I vote to repeal legislation that would provide the 107,000 individuals in my congressional district who have pre-existing conditions, would I vote to repeal health insurance for more than 32 million Americans who otherwise would have no coverage? No way. Vote this legislation down. Let's support the American people. Keep them with health care. And I yield back. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. I yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Americans enjoy the best health care in the world. Every year, profit motive and American ingenuity create new and better diagnostic tools and treatments. Yes, there are ways to improve America's health care. But President Obama's socialized medicine is not it. For example, we can cut health care costs by implementing tort reform, by forcing health care competition, by removing illegal aliens from America who get free health care at our cost. Socialized medicine strangles creativity and obstructs life-saving medical advances. It is care rationed by bureaucrats with mind-numbing regulations. Simply stated, Socialized medicine pulls all America down to health care mediocrity. Lives and freedom are at stake. We must repeal this job-killing government takeover America health care. Today, I will proudly vote to do exactly that. I yield the remainder of my time. Jim yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. It's now my privilege to yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Lane. Gentleman from Rhode Island is recognized for one and one half minutes. That objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in opposition to the Patients Rights Repeal Bill, and I find it absolutely regrettable that my Republican colleagues have made this their first priority of the new Congress. Rhode Islanders sent me here with a clear purpose to create jobs, strengthen our economy, and reduce the federal deficit. Those are the issues we need to address, and doing so, so should be our first order of business and our top priority. Instead, we're considering a bill that will increase already skyrocketing health care premiums for Rhode Island families and businesses, give insurers back the power to deny or drop coverage when people get sick, and raise the deficit by an additional $230 billion over the next 10 years and over $1 trillion the decade after that. Pressing the reset button on health reform will not only bring uh, our progress toward affordable and accessible health care to a screeching halt, it will force us to repeal the rights of patients 
and rescind tax breaks to the very small businesses that fuel our economy. I urge my colleagues to oppose this bill and join me in getting to work on the people's priorities, job creation, economic innovation, and deficit reduction. We have come such a long way. We've already seen the benefits of health care reform in covering children with pre-existing conditions, allowing adult children to stay on their uh, parents' health care uh, coverage, uh, eliminating uh, the uh, uh, yearly and lifetime caps. These are major steps forward in health care reform, and all that goes away if we re repeal uh, this uh, health care law that we've seen put into effect. Uh, please oppose uh, this uh, uh, Republican uh, bill that's before us today. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. General's time has expired. General from Michigan, Mr. Camp. I yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Palazzo. Gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to express my strong support for the repeal of this health care monstrosity. It was a bill passed over the objections of most Mississippians, built on unconstitutional individual mandates and unprecedented burdens for state governments. In short, this government takeover is poised to destroy the greatest health care system in the world. Don't take my word for it, but look at some of the most ardent backers have been quietly working to obtain special waivers so they will not be held to the same standards most small businesses face. Mr. Speaker, it's time we give all Americans the same relief the President's political friends have worked so hard to get, relief from this job-destroying legislation by voting in favor of its repeal. I am proud that the first speech I have given in this chamber and the first bill I have co-sponsored in this Congress is one to repeal this 2,700-page monstrosity. I yield back. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. Mr. Speaker, I now yield a minute to the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. The lady from Florida is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to share the story of Patricia Mache. Pat, as her friends call her, lives outside Tucson and has been fittingly hailed as one of the heroes during the tragic shooting of our colleague Gabby Gifford's. Pat actually knocked the second gun clip out of the shooter's hand as he was attempting to reload, very likely saving the lives of more innocent people. She was in line to talk to her congresswoman to share that she thought that the title of the repeal bill was disingenuous and because Pat and her husband own a small business north of Tucson. The spouse of one of their employees has a pre-existing condition and they've been unable to find affordable insurance to cover her. Pat wanted to tell Congresswoman Giffords that the health reform law will help them provide insurance for this employee. She wanted Gabby to stand up to attempts to repeal health care reform. Pat was unable to deliver her message to her representative but asked that I share it with you now. Heed the words of Pat Mish. Heed the words of millions of Americans needing health care. Don't repeal health care reform. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. General, his time has expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. At this time, I yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back in September of last year, one of the owners of a small Waco, Texas software company showed me a notice he had just received from his health insurance provider. This notice showed that as a result of Obamacare, he was faced with a 30% increase in his health insurance premiums. Now he has to deal with the harsh reality of cutting the size of his workforce to deal with this increase, or worse, to cancel coverage altogether. What, he, what is even more disturbing, is this is just the beginning of what is to come under Obamacare. All across our nation, this cost-increasing, job-killing, tax-hiking bill is inflicting irreversible damage on American employers and families. Rather than learn from this and the outcome of the midterm elections, Democrats choose to oppose and dismiss Republican efforts to repeal Obamacare and to replace it with something better. There are solutions and clear alternatives to improving our health care system, and the first step is to repeal, to repeal Obamacare. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Yields back. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. I Levin. yield to the gentleman from New York for unanimous consent. I rise, in I rise in strong opposition to repealing the Patients' Bill of Rights. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Could I ask Mr. Camp, um, how much time is there left on both sides for ways and means? The gen gentleman from uh, Michigan, Mr. Levin, has two minutes remaining. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, has three minutes remaining. Could I ask my colleague, are you going to close? We I will close now. 
Do you have any more speakers? I have three remaining speakers. You have how much time? I have three remaining speakers. Why don't you use up uh, some of your time and then I'll close. We have three minutes remaining. At this time then I'll yield one minute to uh, the distinguished gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisenga. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one minute. Uh, thank you. I uh, thank the gentleman for yielding and Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 2. A lot has been said during this debate about what the American people want. Some have said the American people want Obamacare. Many others have said that they want a repeal of it. Well, I was not in Washington over this past year. I was in Michigan hearing complaint after complaint from regular citizens and small business owners about the cost and unreasonable mandates that are in Obamacare. I told them to stay tuned. Well, the American people have spoken. And over the past week, I've had an opportunity to engage my constituents even more, including hosting three telephone town hall meetings. We did a survey as part of those town halls, and over two-thirds of the thousand of the people that took part in this survey agreed with an, uh, my position of repealing Obamacare. I understand the real concerns and health issues that people have, but we will address these issues in the replace portion that you'll be seeing soon, so please stay tuned. I'm also a small business owner, and I've been talking to other small business owners, and they too are frustrated. Provisions like the costly mandate requiring them to file additional 1099 forms have made them angry. Mr. Speaker, I, I ask you to uh, join me in voting to replace this bill. Tom Jones expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Mr. Camp. Mr. Speaker, uh, I believe we have the right to close. Gentleman's correct. All right. Uh, then I have two remaining speakers, and the second one will be the speaker who closes. So why don't you call on one, and I'll close, and then you All right. Speaker. Thank you. Then at this time, I yield uh, one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Nunnally. The gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for one minute. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding. As a former member of the Appropriations Committee in the Mississippi State Senate, I was responsible for balancing our state's budget. The Affordable Care Act will push added costs to already strapped states and will ultimately require tax increases at the state level. The overall cost to implement health reform in Mississippi is $1.7 billion over 10 years. From fiscal year 2014 to 2020, this dramatic increase in enrollment will cost our taxpayers an extra $225 to $250 million a year, adding approximately 400,000 new individuals to our Medicaid rolls making the expansion meaning one in three Mississippians will be on Medicaid. More money devoted to Medicaid means less funding for other necessary state services and added financial burdens on our taxpayers in Mississippi as well as the rest of the taxpayers of this nation that will further stifle job creation. So because of that, I will proudly vote to repeal this law. Time of gentleman's expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. First, I ask unanimous consent that a list of more than 200 organizations opposed to this repeal be entered into the record. That objection. I regret this bill is being brought up today, but there are at least two silver linings. Number one, this bill will not become law. Health care reform remains the law of this land. And secondly, most importantly, it gives us Democrats a further chance to talk sense with the American people. We on this side are on the offensive on this issue. We are going everywhere. We are an American truth squad. There will be a vote today on this, on this bill. It may well pass. It will not prevail. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. At this time, I yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for one minute. Thank the gentleman for yielding, uh, Mr. Speaker. Today we're debating the repeal of economically damaging legislation that punishes job creators and does nothing to control rising health care costs. We can't afford the one $1.2 trillion price tag on the government takeover of health care while our national debt stands at $14 trillion. 
Today we can right a serious wrong and still achieve the goals we share, like ensuring access to quality, affordable health care for all Americans, real health care reforms that control costs, and ensuring that Americans with pre-existing conditions get the care they need at a price they can afford. In my district in eastern and southeastern Ohio, more than 20,000 senior citizens currently enrolled in Medicare Advantage are at risk of losing this program because of the $200 billion in cuts to Medicare required by this job-destroying health care law. Later today, we'll vote to repeal government takeover, giving us the opportunity to start over and enact real patient-focused health care reforms. I yield back the remainder of my time. Jim yields back. All time for this portion of the debate has expired. Under the rule, an additional 30 minutes of debate is ordered to be equally divided and controlled by the majority leader and the minority leader or their designees. Chair recognizes the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now yield one and a half minutes to the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Perkle. Gentlelady from New York is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 2 because I believe that the American people deserve health care reform that will actually reduce costs and improve access without damaging the quality of our health care. Last year's enacted health care reform was a victory for big government and an affront to our Constitution. This law is so fundamentally flawed, it must be repealed. When our founders envisioned this legislative process, it was meant to be a deliberative one, thoughtful and respectful of the American freedom, of the American citizens' freedom. Last year, that vision faltered, and Congress failed in its duties to the American people when they enacted this Affordable Care Act. As a registered nurse and an attorney who represented a major teaching hospital, I am aware of the problems of our current system, in particular the problems arising from government restrictions of, on the purchase of health insurance, government regulations on hospitals and businesses, and tort liability issues. Unfortunately, this, un this Affordable Care Act does not alleviate these problems and will further damage an overburdened system. According to the Health Care Association of New York State, my home state, we will face a $15 billion reduction in Medicare, Medicaid, affecting our hospitals, our skilled nursing facilities, our home health agencies, and hospices over the next 10 years. We need to implement true health care reform in a manner that preserves patient choice, protects access to health care, and controls cost without hurting job growth. I yield. Thank and you. The gentlelady is expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina as the designee of the minority leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself two minutes. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, in 1966, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., whose life and legacy we just finished celebrating, expressed his concerns about health care. He stated that of all forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. Those words were brought home to me last year when a constituent from Florence, South Carolina, told me that she had just been informed by her insurance carrier that because of her eight-year-old daughter's cancer treatment, her family had reached their lifetime benefits limit. What could be more inhumane than repealing this law's patient's rights and telling that mother that the life-saving treatments for her daughter must end? What could be more shocking than the injustice suffered by the middle-aged woman who called into a radio program to complain that although she had paid her premiums her entire adult life, she was dropped by her insurer when she contracted breast cancer. How can we repeal the remedy for this injustice? Dr. King also taught us 
that the time is always right to do right. After nearly a century of debate, last March the time was ripe, and getting rid of these discriminatory practices was the right thing to do. And that is the reason I called the bill, the Civil Rights Act of the 21st century. Interestingly, today we're hearing some of the same rhetoric about repeal of patients' rights that we heard regarding voting rights. Do I feel that changes should not be made? Absolutely not. When the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, it did not cover public employees. When the 1965 Voting Rights Act became law, it did not cover, I hear myself 30 additional seconds, it did not cover congressional and legislative redistricting. The fair law, fair housing law, wasn't perfect when it was passed. Bipartisan changes were made to improve all of these measures. I sincerely hope that we can develop some bipartisan modifications that increase efficiency and effectiveness and decrease costs and duplication, none of which will be achieved through repeal. Now, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, I now yield one and a half minutes to I yield one and a half minutes to the gentlelady from Minnesota, Ms. Bachman. The gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from Virginia. Obamacare, as we know, is the crown jewel of socialism. It is socialized medicine. The American people spoke soundly and clearly at the ballot box in November. And they said to us, Mr. Speaker, in no uncertain terms, repeal this bill. And so today, this body will cast a vote to repeal Obamacare. And to those across the United States, who think this may be a symbolic act, we have a message for them. This is not symbolic. This is why we were sent here, and we will not stop until we repeal a president and put a president in the position of the White House who will repeal this bill, until we repeal the current Senate, put in a Senate that will listen to the American people and repeal this bill. Because what has been the result, Mr. Speaker? It's been this. It's been job loss. It's been increases on costs to the American people. I've seen everything from 26 percent increases on health insurance to 45 percent increases on health insurance. This will break the bank, and we won't let that happen to our country. So make no mistake, Mr. Speaker, we are here to stay, and our resolve is firm. We will continue this fight until Obamacare is no longer the law of the land and until we can actually pass reform that will cut the costs of health care. And I yield back. Gentleman General has expired. Gentleman from South Carolina. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to yield two minutes to the chair of the Democratic Caucus, Mr. Lawson of Connecticut. Gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for two minutes. Technical difficulties, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman from South Carolina. Equal protection under the law is the cornerstone of our Constitution. That is why we as a nation strive to form a more perfect union in a common sense way of looking out for one another. No one can prepare for a birth defect, catastrophe, or accident of life that may await any one of us. This Congress cannot disenfranchise the 129 million Americans with pre-existing conditions impacted by this repeal proposal. The proposal that is before us is not worthy of the party of Lincoln or the Tea Party. Repeal, repeal, repeal is not a plan. It is an empty political refrain. Colleagues on the other side of the aisle are honorable people. I cannot accept that they are indifferent to the 129 million Americans with pre-existing conditions who would continue to be denied coverage and forced to pay higher rates with repeal. I cannot accept 
that they are indifferent to millions of children who would once again face denial of health care coverage. I don't believe they are indifferent to the millions of seniors who would be facing higher prescription drug costs because of repeal. I cannot accept that they are indifferent to the families that face cancer diagnosis and would once again be subject to lifetime limits on coverage and possible bankruptcy because of repeal. Addressing these fundamental issues of fairness was what the health care legislation and law is all about. In this chamber, and clearly down the hall, we may understand the charade of this repeal legislation, but it is not lost on the 129 million Americans with pre-existing conditions that are counting on us. Time the gentleman's expired. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now yield one and a half minutes to the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Nome. The gentlelady is recognized for one and one half minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I rise today for the first time on the floor of the United States House of Representatives to make a case for a very important piece of legislation, namely H.R. 2, the Health Care Repeal Bill. Mr. Speaker, there are a multitude of reasons why this law should be repealed, but the most important is because it is a major impediment to job creation for small businesses and job creators in South Dakota and across this country. According to one study, an employer mandate alone could lead to the elimination of 1.6 million jobs between 2009 and 2014, with 66 percent of those coming from small businesses. Mr. Speaker, one of the most important jobs and job creation measures that we can do this year is to repeal this bill and to replace it with common sense policies that actually lower costs for families and for small businesses, expand access for affordable care, and protect American jobs. What I heard time and time again on the campaign trail last year from South Dakota small business owners is that they are simply waiting. They're waiting to hire another worker or to invest in new technology because of the looming threat of this health care law. Whether it's a foundry owner in northeastern South Dakota or a motorcycle parts manufacturer in central South Dakota, the refrain is the same, get the government off our backs. And we'll be in the small business job creation engine that this country so desperately needs right now. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to listen to the citizens of this great country on this important issue. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. General Lay's time has expired. General of South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to uh, yield two minutes to the gentlelady uh, from Connecticut, the chair of our policy committee. The gentlelady from Connecticut is recognized for two minutes. Yesterday, men and women from all across America came here to tell us what the repeal of health care would mean for them. Stacy Ritter of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, told us how her 11-year-old daughters, twin daughters, were both diagnosed with leukemia at age four. She explained how the Affordable Care Act finally ensured her daughters could get coverage and the care that they need. Claudette Theriot of Sabatis, Maine, told us how health care reform had given her access to critical preventive care, the type of care that saves money and saves lives. Ed Burke of Palm Harbor, Florida, told us how the prohibition on lifetime caps had brought security and peace of mind after years of living with hemophilia. We hear stories like this every day in my district and all across America. Yesterday, a report found that up to 129 million Americans under age 65 have pre-existing conditions and could lose their coverage if reform is repealed. I understand their fears. I, too, have a pre-existing condition. I am an ovarian cancer survivor. The Center for American Progress reports that repeal would add almost $2,000 a year to family insurance premiums, destroy up to 
400,000 jobs a year over the next decade, and the Congressional Budget Office says repeal would add $230 billion to the deficit. Repeal will take away valuable benefits, destroy jobs, cause premiums to rise, and add billions to the deficit. If my colleagues across the aisle will not listen to the facts and the numbers, then listen to the poignant stories of their and our constituents. What will happen to Stacy's twins, Claudette, Ed, and millions of other Americans if health care reform is repealed? What will happen to children with pre-existing conditions, to seniors in the donut hole, to small business trying to help their employees find quality health insurance? Repeal is a mistake. We should not work to further strengthen our health care system, and we should do that, not roll back hard-won progress. Health care should not be a political game. Donald gentlelady is expired. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now yield one and a half minutes to the Secretary of the Republican Conference, a gentleman from Texas. The gentleman from Mr. Texas Carter. is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted to find that the President has finally found common ground with the conservatives. The President wrote in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that he issued an executive order calling for all agencies to identify job killing and costly red tape that can be eliminated. We should help him resolve this by eliminating thousands of new regulations that will be dumped on individuals and businesses over the next four years by this bad health care law. The Federal Register contains 6,123 pages of requirements for the new health care rules created by this law. The Center for Health Care Transformation lists 159 new federal agencies created by this law. We can replace this bad bill with bipartisan reforms that can let the people both keep their job and their health insurance. Mr. Speaker, let's support the President's initiative and reduce bad regulations by repealing this bad law. I yield back. Jim yields back. General of South Carolina. Mr. Speaker, may I inquire as to how many more speakers are on the other side? Mr. Speaker, we have five remaining speakers. Well, I continue to reserve. I only have two speakers, and maybe you'd like to catch up. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I now yield two minutes to the Chairman of the Republican Conference, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Henschel. The gentleman from Texas, recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, let me offer 1.6 million reasons why we should repeal Obamacare. That's the number of jobs that will be lost from just one provision, the employer mandate, according to the NFIB, the largest small business organization in America. The half a trillion dollars in new taxes, the 1099 form, the minimum benefit standard, all job-crushing regulations. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to Obamacare, you cannot help the job seeker by punishing the job creator. Let me offer 2.6 trillion more reasons that we must repeal Obamacare. That is the true cost of this legislation. $700 billion more added to the deficit. Now, I know my friends on the other side of the aisle will contend something else, but somehow in their accounting, they left out the $115 billion it cost to implement. They double accounted almost a half a, uh, a trillion dollars in taxes. Social Security, uh, cutting Medicare by half a billion, the sleight of hand of 10 years of taxes, six years of spending. Mr. Speaker, you cannot improve the health care of a nation by impoverishing its children. Here's one more reason, Mr. Speaker. The American people don't want it. It's personal. Here's my story. Two days ago, I was in San Antonio, Texas, my mother had a large tumor removed from her head. They wheeled her away at 7.20 in the morning. By noon, I was talking to her along with the rest of our family. It proved benign. Thanks to a lot of prayers and good doctors at the Methodist Hospital in San Antonio, my mother's fine. I'm not sure that would be the outcome in Canada, the UK, anywhere in Europe. 
No disrespect to our president, but when it comes to the health of my mother, I don't want this president or any president or his bureaucrats or commissions making decisions for my loved ones. Let's repeal it today, replace it tomorrow. Town and gentleman's expired. I continue the majority leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it's now my pleasure to yield two minutes to the majority whip, the gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy. The gentleman from California is recognized for two minutes. Well, I thank the gentleman for yielding. First of all, let me say I respect my friends on the other side of the aisle. And I do believe you all, like us, want to improve America's health care system. Congressional Republicans and Democrats don't differ on that goal. Where we differ, and differ quite drastically, is on how to accomplish this goal. And the American people's opinion on health care reform radically differs from that, Mr. Speaker, of President Obama and the Congressional Democrats. Americans understand that our health care system, warts and all, is still the very best in the world. We have the best doctors, nurses, hospitals, and health innovators in the world. We should be working together to improve the system rather than turning it over to thousands of health care bureaucrats who believe they can make better choices than patients and doctors. And you know the debate today is a little different than the debate that I remember when this bill was passed, Mr. Speaker. Members are not held over for a weekend vote. There are not protesters outside rallying wanting to, Mr. Speaker, to have their voices be heard. Today is an open, cordial discussion. That's what the American people ask for. A health care system that works, that doesn't deter. A health care system devised by the patient and doctor. Mr. Speaker, our families deserve better. Our small businesses deserve better. And to all my colleagues, America deserves better. Let's repeal this health care bill. Start to replace it with an open and honest debate where the American people are involved, patients are involved, doctors are involved, and the American public can have a health care bill that lowers the cost without destroying jobs and a health care system that keeps the innovation we know so well. I yield back. Town the gentleman's expired. Gentleman South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield two minutes to the Vice Chair of the Democratic Caucus, Mr. Becerra of California. The gentleman from California is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Listening to the, this debate, I can understand why Americans might be confused about the direction of health care in this nation. But let me thank my Republican colleagues for producing at least one important result by debating this misguided Republican plan to repeal patients' health care rights. Millions of Americans are now beginning to understand the valuable rights and freedoms they secured when the Affordable Health Care Act became law last year. Last year, when Eric, a self-employed architect in my district, wrote to me that he and his wife were in a terrible bind, he explained something. They had insurance, but they could only secure the most costly of insurance with the highest deductibles. But the real bind wasn't that. The real bind was that their insurance company refused to include within their health insurance policy their eight-year-old son because their eight-year-old son, son had suffered from a stroke. Now for Eric and his wife and his son, health care reform was real. And today, Eric and his family can get insurance for their son because today Eric and his wife have a right to be insured and to have their son insured because no insurance company today can discriminate against any child for a pre-existing condition. That's what health care reform was all about. It was also about making sure that today America's businesses could afford to offer health insurance to their employees. Health insurance was re reform was about reducing the cost of health care and that's why the impartial referee that we use here in Congress, the Congressional Budget Office, has said that this health reform that was passed last year will save us money despite all the rhetoric that you hear. My Republican friends say repeal 
These health care rights and protections that were extended last year do that today and in the future will restore those rights and make them prettier as well. Well, we have a burden to hand. We don't want to go after two in the bush. For 12 years, hey, they had control of the Congress. For six years, they had a Republican president to work with. They never once did it. Let's keep that burden in hand and move forward for Eric and the rest of America. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's expired. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Scott. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Leader. This health care bill is a job destroying bill. Shifting who pays simply does not reduce the cost of health insurance. As a matter of fact, when you look at it, the CMS says that over the next 10 years, we will see an increase of $311 billion in the cost of health care. This is $2.3 trillion of new taxes on Americans. The deficit over the next, the first decade, over $500 billion of new deficit spending. $1.2, $1.5 trillion in the second decade. Massive bureaucracy. 68 new programs. 47 new bureaucratic entities and 29 pilot programs as a part of this bill. It destroys the relationship, the intimate relationship between a patient and a physician. The NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, says that over the next 10 years, we will lose 1.6 trillion, 1.6 million jobs in America because of this bill. By destroying the bill that destroys jobs, we make progress. Finally, we already have a $76 trillion hole in unfunded entitlements. By increasing the number of entitlements, we simply increase the whole. Another $2.7 trillion, $2 trillion expansion in entitlement spending. The 10 years revenue simply does not pay for the six years of benefits. Thank you. Time the gentleman's expired. Gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to yield two minutes to the chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Mr. Steve Israel of New York. The gentleman from New York is recognized for two minutes. I thank my friend. Mr. Speaker, I rise to oppose this bill. This vote establishes who you're for. Are you for insurance company profits or are you for the middle class? I'm for Hannah Watson of Bayshore, Long Island. Hannah was born with spina bifida. Was born with spina bifida. She had multiple surgeries and a kidney transplant before the age of 12. At 12 years old, three months after her last surgery, her insurance company told her that she had reached her annual cap and they would not pay for additional treatment. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, Hannah was able to finally get on her parents' insurance at an affordable rate with no lifetime caps. This Health Care Act was for Hannah Watson. Now I hear people saying, well, you know what, I'm not, I don't have spina bifida. Why should I care? Well, Hannah did not choose to have spina bifida. Nobody makes that choice. The Health Care Act helped Hannah. It helped her neighbors. It helped others. Why would you want to look at Hannah and say, we're repealing those protections, Hannah? I'm for Catherine Marquot of North Babylon. Catherine had breast cancer. And as she was recovering from bre breast cancer, her insurance company told her that it was a pre-existing condition and they would no longer pay for her treatment. Now I hear people saying, well, why should I care? I'm not Catherine Marquardt. I don't have breast cancer. One out of every nine women in America have breast cancer. You know somebody who has breast cancer. Why would you want to say to them, that is repealed, that consumer protection is repealed, you are on your own? And finally, Mr. Speaker, I understand the notion that this is not a perfect bill and there are things that we can improve. My friends on the Republican side are in the majority, and if they can think of ways to improve it, I believe we should work with them. But this is not improving it, this is repealing it. This is repealing every word of it. This is repealing every vowel of it. This is repealing every consumer protection of it. This is repealing it for every one of us, for Hannah and Catherine, for one out of every nine women who have breast cancer, for all Americans with pre-existing conditions, and it ought not be repealed. I thank the gentleman. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Majority Leader. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions. Gentleman is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank Majority Leader, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Cantor. Mr. Speaker, uh, I uh, believe that the Democrats' health care law will do for health care what the stimulus did for jobs. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle promised the American people greater access to quality health care and affordable health care. Well, the only problem is, is that the law does not increase quality and does not save Americans one dime on their health care cost. In fact, what is known as Obamacare will end up costing every single American more in health care premiums and in taxes. To pay for the trillion, $200 billion gross expansion of the federal government. Mr. Speaker, the Democrats' health care law is about taxes, it's about mandates, it's cuts to Medicare, job losses, deficit spending, and new federal bureaucracies. The reality is, is that we cannot pay for health care entitlements we have, much less a new government takeover of health care that adds trillions of dollars to our existing liabilities, driving up costs even further, and putting the federal government in charge of health care decision making. The path to greater choice for parents, for patients, and lower costs all must be a part of an answer that is about repealing this costly health care bill. I support the repeal today and will vote tomorrow for the resolution to replace it with a promise of real solutions. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time's expired. Gentleman from South Carolina. Mr. Speaker, may I inquire as to the time remaining? Gentleman from South Carolina has four and one half minutes remaining. The majority leader has two and one half minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield the balance of the time to the Democratic whip. Gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Hoyer of Maryland. I thank the gentleman Maryland for right yielding, right. and I rise in opposition to this bill to repeal. Last year, we enacted a reform bill, Health Care for America, to make it easier for small businesses to cover their employees, to take important steps to bring down costs, to stop insurance companies' uh, abuses that bankrupt sick Americans and deny them coverage. We acted in the face of a crisis a cost crisis which saw premiums more than double over the last decade, a coverage crisis which saw more than 40 million Americans without health care insurance, and a fiscal crisis which saw the cost of health care driving our country deeper and deeper into the red. A constituent of mine from Southern Maryland recently wrote to thank us for health reform that uh, now lets her carry her 21-year-old daughter on her insurance, but she wrote that something else was uh, also inspired her to support this piece of legislation. Seeing, and I quote, a lot of other people who are hardworking, honest people who were going bankrupt because of unexpected medical expenses. Those were the stories we had in mind last year when we passed the health reform law, and today as we fight to protect it. Nonpartisan observers tell us that it will reduce the rise in premiums for millions, cover 95 percent of Americans, and contribute to reducing our deficit. The opponents of health care reform have spent more than a year painting it in apoplectic terms. But they can't erase the history that proves that bringing affordable care to all Americans has long been the goal of both parties. Just yesterday, former Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, a Republican, said, and I quote, the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land, the fundamental platform upon which all future efforts to make that system better will be based. That was Senator, Republican, leader of the Senate, Bill Frist from Tennessee, one of the great medical practitioners in this country, a doctor. In 2008, Senator John McCain said this, quote, we should have available and affordable health care to every American citizen. There has been no alternative offered to accomplish that objective. And in 2006, when signing a state bill remarkably similar to Affordable Care Act, 
Governor Mitt Romney, Republican, leading candidate for president of the United States in the Republican Party, said this of that bill, almost exactly like this one, quote, an achievement like this comes around once in a generation. While our Republican colleagues in Congress failed to take action on health care during a decade of doubling pre premiums and mounting debt, Congress acted last year. Now, my Republican friends have come to the floor with a plan to put insurance companies back in charge of American health care and to strip Americans of their hard-won freedom to make health choices for themselves. Once again, families would face insurance companies' unfair caps on their coverage or find their coverage canceled altogether. Once again, insurance companies could discriminate against children with disabilities and pregnant women. Once again, prescription drug costs for our seniors will go up. And once again, small businesses will be without any help to cover their employees in a world of skyrocketing premiums. There's no arguing with the facts. Repeal would cost our economy as many as 400,000 per jobs, notwithstanding the rhetoric on the other side. They would be lost under the burden of crushing health care costs. And repeal would pile up over $1.2 trillion of additional debt on our children over the next two decades. I urge my colleagues, preserve Americans' freedoms to control their own care. Join together to protect a system that meets the objectives set by generations of American presidents. <coughs> President Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, George H.W. Bush, Clinton, and George W. Bush, as well as President Obama. Oppose this repeal bill. All time of the gentleman from South Carolina has expired. Majority Leader. Ms. Speaker.